Welcome to Bridgeway's online service. Dr. Anderson shares a special message with us this morning on five ways to master your money. We want to encourage you to engage in service today. You can do that by sharing the link. You can do that by utilizing the comment section. And we certainly hope that you engage not only in worship, but also today in the word. If you have children in the house, we encourage you to visit bridgeway.cc forward slash kids to allow your children to get fully engaged. Today's a special day as we celebrate the Lord's table, and you'll want to prepare for communion by getting some elements from your kitchen to represent the bread and the cup. Let's pray for today's service. God in heaven, we thank you and praise you that you are a God who is famous for changing lives. We pray that you would change us today as we seek to exalt you above all things. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now Welcome let's to worship together. Welcome to church, everybody. We're so excited to be here to worship with you. When you get to a part of the song that you know, won't you sing with us? We just want to worship the God of our salvation. There is no fear, for I believe. There is no doubt, for I have seen your faithfulness. My fortress over and over. Found in your name, I have a strength found in your grace, your faithfulness, my fortress over and over. Make way through the waters, walk me through the fire, do what you are famous for. What you are famous for Shut the mouths of liars Bring dry bones to life And do what you are famous for What you are famous for I believe in you God, I believe in you Release your love inside of me your power for all to see. Spirit, come and fall on us over and over alone. Make way through the water, walk me through the fire. Do what you are famous for, what you are famous for. Abundantly, more than you ask or think, Lord, you will never fail. Your name is powerful, your word unstoppable. All things are possible in you, God of exceedingly, God of abundantly, more than we ask or think, Lord, you will never.
miracle. God can do great things that he can do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask, think, or imagine. Come on, let's worship him together and let's believe God together. Come on, let's sing. Said, I've seen you move. You move the mountain and I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there was no that praise over us. Come on, sing over. Say, Come on, declare it in this atmosphere. Say, Raise it up and say, oh. Come on, declare it. Say, Just raise it up a little bit louder. Come on, say, say, oh, oh, sing, oh, God, we receive your love, say.
Reading from the scripture this morning is from the first John chapter 1 verse 5 through 7. I'll be reading in Korean. 우리가 저에게 듣고 너희에게 전하는 소식이 이것이니 곧 하나님은 빛이시니라. 그에게는 어둠이 조금도 없으시니라. 만일 우리가 하나님의 사귐에 있다 하고 어두운 가운데 행하면 거짓말을 하고 진리를 행치 아니함이거니와 저가 빛 가운데 계신 것 같이 우리도 빛 가운데 행하면 우리가 서로 사랑이 있고 그 아들 예수의 피가 우리를 모든 죄에서 깨끗하게 하실 것입니다. 하나님의 말씀입니다. Here ends the reading of God's word. Thank you. The Last Supper, which we refer to as communion, took place the night Jesus was betrayed, the night before he was crucified. Communion symbolizes the atoning sacrifice Christ made for us. The bread symbolizes his body, which was broken for you and me. The wine symbolizes the blood that was shed and the new covenant between God and his people. As my sister Heidi said, 
Communion symbolizes the atoning sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for you, for me, and for the entire world. But communion is not just a simplistic ritual that we take part in. It is an act of worship and obedience to Christ's command to participate in it as often as we remember him. And in addition, communion symbolizes the fellowship between Jesus Christ and those who place their complete faith and trust in him for salvation. So we ask that if you are not in a committed relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, or perhaps you don't know what that means, that you would allow this time for believers specifically and that you not take part in it. But for those who are believers in Jesus Christ, this is a time of self-examination and reflection on our fellowship with God. Are we in lock and step with him in our walk and our journey with him? I'm going to read the verse of scripture that was read earlier in Korean. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. And it says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And certainly this is not saying that the act of communion cleanses us of all sin. We know that that is already accomplished in the finished work of Jesus Christ. But as we take this time to do a heart check to make sure that we are in lock and step with God in our walk with him, this is a, a time of reflection and a time of confession. If we are walking in darkness, truly we are lying to ourselves, and more importantly, we are lying to God. But you know, if you read further down in that passage of Scripture, if you go to verse 9, it says this for believers in Jesus Christ. It says that if we confess our sin, that He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Father, we love you, and we thank you, Lord, that you love us so much more. And Lord, we come to you um, thanking you for your grace and mercy, first and foremost. But Lord, we are glad that we can run to you when we have fallen short. And Lord, as we partake in this time of communion, I pray for each person who is dealing with an area of sin in their lives, Lord, with that sin that so easily besets them, dear Father. Father, I pray um, that they will come to you for forgiveness and that they will deal with that with you personally. And Lord, um, as we get ready to take these elements, prepare our hearts and our minds about the seriousness of what communion truly, truly means, Lord. We feel blessed to be able to participate in it. And Lord, for that person who does not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray, Lord, that they will come to you once and for all and ask for forgiveness of their sins and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior, and that this may even be their first communion. We love you, Father, and we thank you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread gave thanks for it, and broke it into pieces. He said, this is my body that was broken for you. Do this to remember me. Let's eat together. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup. And he said that this cup represents a new covenant between God and his people. Let's drink in communion. Father God, we thank you so much for the sacrifice you made for us. May we live our lives in a way that reflects the sacrifice that you've made for us, Lord, and that allows us to love others in the same way that you've loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And as our longstanding tradition at Bridgeway, after we take communion, we say three times, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank, thank you, you, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And also, we thank Heidi Mobley from our Elders Council of Women and Pastor Sandy Pope for leading us in communion. Last week, we talked about multi-generational parenting or mothering. Today, I want to talk about multi-generational money. What emotion comes up when the subject of money is about to be preached or taught in church? Stress? Excitement? Nervousness? Guilt? Shame? Maybe hope? Well, today I hope to evoke positive emotions and confidence with practical knowledge. So let's pray together and get right into God's word on today's topic, Mastering Your Money. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have an opportunity to use money uh, to live our lives and to build the kingdom of God. Give us real practical knowledge on this as well as a spiritual word that might help us. And wherever people are, different levels of income, maybe none at all, we pray, God, that your word would be an encouragement as well. For it is in the name of Jesus we pray. Together everyone said, amen and amen. I'll have many scriptures for you, but I want to start with Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. So let's listen to Jesus' words about money and about our treasures. This is what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So he wants us to know that our money and our treasures is a heart issue with regard to where we put it. He goes on to say in verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body, and if your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So your money can be used in a way that's dark or in a way that helps bring light uh, to other people as well as yourselves. And then he kind of ends it with this before he moves on to a passage about worrying, which follows on about money. He says in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. That word serve is that Greek word doulos or a slave to, right? So no one can be a slave to two masters. You have one or the other. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other and then drop the mic, you cannot serve both God and money. Which one will be your master? We're going to talk about God being our master and us mastering money today. God's desire is that we serve him and allow money to serve us. God desires that we serve him and be devoted to him only and allow money to serve us. So the question of the day is this, how do we master money without allowing money to master us? How do we master money without allowing money to master us? With educations and the skills that we have and the desire that you have to earn money, many of you have earning potential but there are different levels of earning potential. And it's not how much you make, but it's really the goal of what you need money for and what you plan on doing with it. The goal is to make enough to satisfy your bills and make a living wage, to advance your family from generation to generation, and to advance the kingdom of God through generosity. Limiting debt and saving money is critical to making dollars work for you. And it's important that you work for money because earning a living wage is absolutely important and all of us have the ability to earn money. And so what I want to do is I want to give you five ways to master your money. Five ways to master your money. And the first one is to make it. You got to make it. 
You got to earn money. Now, for those who don't have the ability to earn money, um, you know, thank God for social uh, programs and, and the generosity of, of God's people to help those who may not have that ability. Maybe there's disablement or problems with one's mental health. So there should be a social safety net to help those who can't earn money. But there are people who sometimes have the ability to earn it, but they just don't do it. And so it's important to understand a principle, and that is this. You got to make it, all right? You have earning potential, go out and make money. In fact, 2 Thessalonians 3.10 puts it like this. If you don't work, you don't eat. Let me quote it for you in the New International Version. It says, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. So we're not talking about one who's unable to work. We're talking about one who's unwilling to work. Do you know anybody who's unwilling to work? Well, if you're able-bodied and you can work, you ought to work. Because some people, if we are honest, could fall into a category of what the Proverbs talks about in 26, 14, and 15. This is what it says. As the door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns on his bed. The sluggard buries his hands in the dish. He is too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. Slothfulness and laziness is something that will make you poor and keep you poor. So if you are going to master your money, you must first make it by producing income. And investing your money through wise transactions is biblical. In fact, Matthew says it himself in Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30, as he records Jesus's parable. Jesus says that we are supposed to take the talents that he gives us. And in that passage, he says some people are given one talent. Others are given two talents. Some are given five talents. And the one who had one talent, guess what? He, he never, ever did anything with it but bury it. And so what do you do with that? And, 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 and he actually says the one with two talents then invested it. The one with five talents invested it and made so much more. So you've got to make it, but then you have to secondly multiply it. All right. And when you multiply it, you are taking what God has given you and you invest it in such a way that it actually makes more money. But he says to the person who took the one talent and buried it, he actually rebuked this person as a wasteful person. And he said to them, you are a a wicked person. Servant, But the ones who took the talents that they had or the money that they had and invested it, when the master came back to collect, they had made twice as much. And listen to what Jesus says in this parable in verse 21. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Did you see that? Come and share in your master's happiness. The Lord is saying, listen, I will help you become happy when you take the resources I've given you and you invest it in a way where you can multiply what I have given you. And so it's important to understand that God is actually trusting us as managers and as stewards of money to not only earn it and make it, but also to multiply it, to take what we have and multiply it. And that's a process of discipleship. It's not just multiplying money, but we multiply people's spiritual growth. And when somebody takes in the spiritual growth that God has for them, God doesn't say that growth is for you only. God says, now I want you to entrust to other reliable people what I've taught you. And what I put in you, you now put in other people, and then they're going to put it in other people. And so that's how generations work. You take something and you pass it to the next generation so that they can take it and pass it to the next generation. And so what God is saying is with money, I want you to multiply it so you can do more with it. Invest it. And by the way, one of the best ways to invest is to give back to God. Because giving is an attitude of worship. It's an act of worship, but it's also an investment act. 
Because when you give to the Lord, you're actually, the text tells us in other places like in 1 Corinthians 9 and so forth, it tells us that giving is like sowing a seed. And when you sow a seed, you are investing in the future and trusting God for a great ROI, a great return on your investment. On the other hand, when you rob God by not giving to him, your faith is limited as well as your abundance in life. So while we talk about multiplying money, we've got to understand that one of the best investments we make is when we invest our resources into the kingdom of God because God says it's good soil when you put it in a good ministry, when you give it to God because he's your master, when you do that, it actually returns on your investment, not just financially, but in other areas of your life. The overflow that God will give you when you invest in his kingdom is an overflow of peace and prosperity and, and happiness and also areas in your marriage and in your family and to the generational seeds that you have. I mean, God is saying that if you will bless me with your money, if you will make it and then multiply it and then use that as a seed that you are putting into the soil to advance the kingdom of God, I will bless you. But then there is a third way to help you master your money. Make it, multiply it, maximize it. Maximizing your money takes it from a place of multiplication to a place of maximizing it. We talked about multiplying our money by investing, which is one of the things that are important. But maximizing what you have multiplied is something else. You make it, you multiply it, and then you maximize what you multiply. See, one of the best ways to maximize what you've multiplied is multiple streams of income. Multiple streams of income is where most wealthy people compound their money by leveraging more than one aspect of income in order to make more. Maximizing your money is taking what you've multiplied through investments and then spreading it out into multiple streams. And this is, this is really important because one of the things that God wants to show us is that he's always been about multiplication and maximizing. In fact, you'll be surprised at this scripture. When I saw it uh, months ago, I copied, pasted, wrote it, sent it to friends, and it ministered to them because the friends that I sent it to said, this is in the Bible? Like, it's hard to believe that this is in the Bible. But I want you to hear what, what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 2. Be careful who you send it to, but I'm telling you, when I saw this in the Bible, I'm like, yes. So it's not just something I'm making up in my mind. God really does want us to multiply and maximize our money. Check it out. Are you ready? Ecclesiastes 11.2. Here it is. Invest in seven ventures. Yes, in eight. You do not know what disaster may come upon the land. Have you ever seen that before? Like, wow. Invest in seven ventures. Yes, eight. Because you do not know what disaster. Hello, pandemic. You do not know what disaster will come on the land. But if you have multiple streams of income, it won't ruin you. Some people were ruined because all they had was income from one stream. And when the pandemic hit, they lost everything because they didn't have multiple streams. And yet the wisest man besides Jesus, and of course we call him the wisest man in the Bible, Solomon says, invest in seven ventures. Yes, eight. Because you do not know what disaster will come on the land. I'm like, wow, that's actually in there. I got to send it to people. <laughs> but then you get to the very beginning of the world. Remember the Garden of Eden? Did you know that the Garden of Eden had four streams to resource it? You can go read it sometimes, but look in Genesis chapter 2 and see verses 10 and 12. There was one stream, and it's named there, called Pishon. And Pishon, it says, runs through Havilah, where there is, check it out, gold, aromatic resin, and onyx. So there's one stream, one river, if you will, that's running through a place, a town that has all kinds of good stuff, gold and, and, and resin and, and onyx. 
In verse 13, it says there's another one called Gihon. And then in verse 14a, another one called Tigris. And then in 14b, another one called Euphrates. And so right there, before the fall, we see that this beautiful garden has these multiple streams resourcing it. Now, if God had multiple streams flowing resources into the Garden of Eden, why not have multiple streams flowing in the garden of your life? Why not? And so it's important to understand that we must make it, multiply it, maximize it, but fourthly, minister with it. Minister with it. We're talking about five ways to maximize, to master your money, and ministering with the money God has given you takes you to even a different level. You see, when you're resourced with multiple streams, when you've maximized what you've multiplied, when you've made it and earned it, then to minister with it takes you to another level because now you're able to take the resources of overflow in your life and now bless other people with it. Because the Lord did promise, didn't he, that when you bring your tithes into the storehouse, he will give you more than you could ever even imagine. Like you're going to have to have overflow falling out because your barns won't even, won't even be able to, to, to handle it in Malachi chapter 3. Well, what are you supposed to do with the over, overflow? You're supposed to minister with it. God is overflowing not for you, but for all those that need help, that need your generosity. God has given us more than enough in the church to bless the world. If only the church of Jesus Christ would have a generosity mentality. But in order for the church, church of Jesus Christ to have a generosity mentality, the people in the church must have a generosity mentality. And the people in the church can't have a generosity mentality if they have uh, a, a spirit of lack and lacking in their faith and lacking in their belief that God has given them everything they need in order to multiply everything that God has given them. Don't you want to move from a position of trying to get enough money to pay your bills to having enough money that you not only can pay your bills, but you can actually now minister with it? Some of us have never made it to that point because we're still trying to catch up. We're still trying to get out of debt. And guess what? That's a good thing. Get out of debt. Uh, limit spending. But at the end of the day, what God desires is for his people to be able to bless the world. And we can bless the world with a generosity mentality that goes beyond altruism. It goes beyond philanthropy. It goes beyond charity. It's generosity that's generated by a gracious God. And you can begin to minister with the money God has given you. How many people would love to be a minister of money? I mean, can you imagine that? Like you are praying and saying, God, I not only want to make it and, and multiply it and maximize it, God, I want to minister with it. How many of you love to take people out and then to be able to just treat them without it being a stretch? Like, I really want to treat, but I can't treat. Let's split the bill. And the problem with splitting the bill is you never really get it right, do you? I mean, it's always like, okay, so you ordered like three drinks and three appetizers. I ordered a garden salad and an iced tea, and there's five of us, and you want to split it equally. That doesn't even make sense. Can we at least pull the, 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 the menu back out and find out? Mine was like $15. Yours was like $55. And you're talking about let's split it even. And that ain't even. It may be even, but it's not equitable. So look, can I just pay for my salad and, and, and my tea? But then you feel like the weird one, right? And, you know, I, I love going out and taking, taking folk, but I thank God I have the ability to treat or I like to make it clear who's going to pay for it before we even get started so we don't have that stress later. So if someone says, Pastor, I want to treat you. I'll take care of the bill tonight. Order what you want. I'm like, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, because I don't have to worry about it. Or if I invite people out, let me just cover it so nobody else has to worry about it. But when you go Dutch, as they call it, that, that's fine. But what happens, and this has happened in my family many times when I was growing up, you can have 20 people at a Mother's Day dinner, you know, out at a nice restaurant. Everybody's eating. Everybody's having a good time. And then you get to the bill time. People go into the bathroom. Uh, people are like, yeah, can I put it on, on this one and uh, half of it on that one? It gets so complicated. That becomes the most stressful part of the entire meal. But wouldn't it be great if you could say, oh, it's 20 of us. Listen, I got it today. 
takes stress from everybody else, and it actually blesses you because you're able to do it. Doesn't mean you have to do it all the time, but there's just something about it when you can minister with your money. Your generosity blesses other people. And when you become a lender instead of a borrower, you are free to be a blessing to others and to assist in the growth of their faith. And your generosity blesses them and gives them an opportunity to praise God as a testimony. My 21-year-old daughter was able to praise God as a testimony because somebody um, who we didn't even know decided they wanted to buy her a brand new car and bless her with the car as she was coming back as a missionary student from Youth with a Mission, YWAM, an organization where you can go and study. And she was gone for five months in Australia, and she came home, and they blessed her with a brand new car. And they said they wanted this young uh, woman of God who needed a car to have a testimony whenever she drove it. Can I tell you something? She's driving that testimony every day with a smile on her face and telling the story of God's goodness through the generosity of strangers. We as a church have given away a couple of cars. You may remember many years ago, we had a car on the stage. We used it as a drama. We worshiped around it. It was a Nissan Maxica, Maxima, and we're singing, and, and people are wondering what the car is doing up there, and you know they think it's going to be a, a, a drama set and all that. And at the end, we said, actually, we're going to give this car away to somebody in the congregation. And then we asked uh, Myra, our uh, head of our frontline ministry, to come up and read the name, okay, on the card that we had provided so she could read the name out loud uh, so everybody would know in the congregation who was going to be surprised with the blessing of this Nissan Maxima. I don't know if you've been here long enough at Bridgeway, but for those of you who are around, what a moment that was. Myra's like, okay, you want me to come up? Okay, fine, I'll come up and I read it. And so we'll give her an envelope and, and say, open it up. Read it out loud. Say it real loud. And she looked at it, and she, she was mute. I'm like, yo, read it. Well, her name was on it. And she couldn't even read. She was like, huh? What? Would you read it, woman? <laughs> Myra Wagstaff. Wow. Yep, that's your car. Here are the keys. Remember a woman named, uh, I think her name was uh, is Kara. And uh, she uh, was disabled. And she needed a, a van that would be sort of tricked out so that it would work for her where it does the lift and, and things of that sort, right? So, and she needed a significant amount of money in order to do it. And again, we had a situation where we surprised her on stage where she would have the money to purchase her van for her and her cool dog. What was his name? I think his name was Tank. I mean, you know, we've had the blessing of being able to give a, a couple of cars away, and Amber and I have been able to donate a couple of cars to people, and we did two last, last year, the last six months. We blessed uh, two people with cars, and, and the reality is when you can minister with your money, it's actually a, an opportunity to be a blessing to other people who, guess what, they're one day going to do the same thing. They're one day going to do the same thing. People blessed us with housing situations, so guess what we're able to do? Bless other people with housing situations. It just puts it in your DNA, I think, spiritually. When this woman said, yep, we're going to let you live in our house, even though you don't have a job as a young couple, and when you're able to get a job and able to pay, you can start paying, paying us rent with the option to purchase, because I want you to have this townhouse. And it was the first, first home we had ever, ever owned right in Columbia, Maryland, off of High Tour Hill on Yellow Rose Court, a brick corner townhome that we moved into, couldn't afford, and for six months, we weren't able to pay for it until we were able to pay for it, and then we were able to purchase it. So then when we had a house in the mountains, we said that another couple could live there, and we just wanted to be a blessing to them. And so what am I saying? I'm saying you can get to a place where your money also becomes your ministry. Now, you might be thinking, well, well, when do I make all this money? Well, you can make money at any decade in your life, but I like what Bob Beal says. He's a, he's a Christian um, business consultant, 
And he wrote a book called Decade by Decade. I bought everyone uh, in my circle a copy of that book, like my clergy and, and, and things of that sort on a retreat. And we went through each decade. And each decade has a sort of a single focus, if you will. And it all began with an S. So you know, in the 30s, uh, it was, I believe, uh, success. And in the 40s, it was significance. And, and then in the 50s, it was stride. You know, it went through each one of these from uh, 0 to 10, and then all of your teenage years, and then your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, all the way up to your 90s, right, where you get to the, the sort of that final decade, he, the S word was sleep. <laughs> but um, guess what? Out of all the decades, which one do you think is the most money-producing decade? Well, I thought I knew that. I figured, well, it's got to be your 30s or 40s. Guess what he says? He says that your most money-making and producing decade is your 60s your 60s, because that's when all of what you've invested, all of your networks, all of, all of the, the retirement, the, 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 the career money, all of that, you have most potential to make money in your 60s more than any other decade. I was blown, I was blown away by that. But what that helped me to see is that this is not just something where people who are older are like, well, then I guess I can't do anything. No, if you will take your 50s to, to build your stride for your 60s, if you'll take your 40s to build the significance of what you're doing for your 50s, if you'll take your 30s and begin to, to sow into all that you are doing for the future, you can make a huge, huge difference by the time you get to your 60s. Understand that mastering your money is not a one-time thing. It is a lifelong journey like anything else. Food, dieting, exercise, discipleship, bottom line, life. And never let money dictate your morals or master you. You dictate it. You command it. You master it. And by the way, you must think and pray deeper than the money that you have or the money that you lack. You've got to think deeper than the money you have. Because what happens is most people make most decisions based on their money. You're like, no, I make my decisions based on my morals. Actually, more people make decisions based on their money and don't ever think deeper than their money. And their money becomes how they make their decisions. Let me test it. Why do you live in the neighborhood you live in? Why did you buy the house that you bought? Why do you drive the car that you drive? Why do you shop at the places where you shop? Why do you get food from the places where you get food? Guess what? Money. Money, money, money. Now, it doesn't mean that there are, other, there are not other factors that help you think through why this neighborhood over that neighborhood. But you're also thinking through, but I only can afford, right, this neighborhood. Listen to what Warren Buffett says. Warren Buffett says, when you have a, an abundance of money, you then have to parent at a deeper level than the money that you have. Why? Because if your kid says, Daddy, I want a brand new car, how do you tell that kid no when he knows that you could buy the whole dealership? So then with parenting, you have to actually think about why you're saying no deeper than the money. When you don't have the money, you can just say the money. We can't afford it. And then it ends. But what happens when you start thinking deeper than the money? When you start thinking, what is the real reason why I should say no or say yes to a brother, a sister, a friend, a parent, a child, when you don't have the money so that I don't have the money? But what happens when you do have the money? Do you still treat or do you say, I'm allow myself to be treated even though I could buy the restaurant? Because that's going to be a way to minister to somebody else who really wants to bless me. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so what Buffett says is you've got to begin to think much deeper of what, is, what are your roots. And practically, we must adhere to money, yes, and make decisions accordingly, but spiritually we must go deeper. We must adhere to the deeper principles beyond money. Therefore, we've got to master it. And that would be the fifth and final way to master your money, by mastering it and not just managing it. Managing it is important, but we've got to go beyond man man 
uh, managing our money. We've got to go to the deeper principles beyond money. We must appeal to God, the miracle worker who is above and beyond all things. While money can buy health care, we know the greatest physician is God. While money can buy possessions, we know that the one who owns everything is God. While money can buy a level of safety, we know that the ultimate protector is God. And while money can make a great legal defense, we know that the greatest defender who's never lost a case is Jesus Christ. And knowing who the ultimate master is and bowing to him is the difference between idolatry and humility. God is the ultimate master, our master. And the best way to master money is to give it back to the master so that physically we demonstrate our faith while he truly blesses us with great abundance. We start, we end really where we begin. You cannot serve two masters. We also know what money cannot buy. It can't buy peace or morality. It can't buy character, friendship, love, joy, spiritual freedom. And so we realize that we never want money to be our master. We want to serve the master because he gives us what money could never buy. I'll leave you with a final passage, and then I'm going to give you some practical decisions you can make with regard to these five areas. I'm actually going to give you 10 practical decisions based on five ways to master your, your money. And, and I'll put them up on the screen so you can screenshot it because uh, I'm just going to roll through them, okay? But first, let me give you this other passage because it's just, it's a blessing. And I want you to go and read it because I don't have time to go read it. But read Deuteronomy 8, verses 17 and 18. I was able to go over this passage with my, with my elders, with some friends, and also with our clergy. But the bottom line of that passage, you read it on your own, Deuteronomy 8, 18. You want to know what the bottom line of that passage is? That is this. God is the one who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So if you just fill in the blank for wealth, if, you're, if, if you have skills, if you have education, if you have degrees, if you have good looks, whatever it is, God is the one that gives you the ability to produce it. So yeah, you produce it, but God gave you the ability to produce it. So that's why we always go back to the master, because if he, if he didn't give you the brain to do it, you wouldn't be able to do it. If he didn't give you the skills to use your hands, you wouldn't be able to be a builder or a carpenter. If he did not give you the skills to study, you would not be able to get those degrees. If he did not give you the skill to have, have, have uh, the ability to sing, the voice you were given, you didn't pay for. But you could hone it. You could make it good, like we heard today in wonderful worship, right? God gives you the ability to do it. Then you get to choose how I want to produce more with it, how I can produce wealth with it, and also how I can bless God in the world with it. Okay, so remember the five ways to master your money. You can say it with me. Make it, multiply it, maximize it, minister with it, master it. Got it? Okay. Now, let me run through 10 ways, and that's how I'm going to end, end the message. But I want you, when it comes up on the screen, it'll come in two different uh, groups here, so you'll have it. And you can work on this in your small groups, in your life groups, in your own personal life. Here it is. You ready? Ten practical decisions based on the five ways to master your money principles. Here we go. Number one, write a good resume. Write a good resume. Get with an HR professor, uh, professional. Write a good resume. In fact, if you don't know how to write a resume, if you have a resume, you want me to look it over, I'll do it for you. Just send it to me. Go to info at andersonspeaks.com. I love getting people's resumes. Why? It helps me get to know them. Most of us don't know everybody else's background, and it helps me to network and connect people, and I love it. I love the fact that people have gotten jobs, gone into careers, all because of uh, matching people up. It's one of the things I just love to do for people's success. If you want to send me your resume, send it to me, okay? Info at andersonspeaks.com. Number two, network with as many quality, focus-minded people as you can. All right, we have net networks of friends and family, but I'm talking about purposeful, strategic networking with quality and focus-minded people who can take you in the direction that you want to go. Number three, strategically partner with others who are doing what you want to do. So if you know that's the career you want to be in, that's the ministry you want to be in, that's the direction you want to take, then strategically partner with, with others who are doing what you want to do. In other words, do good business with good people and align your services. Again, I love hooking people up from one business to another business to watch them come together and then make, make, make 
lots of money and, and, and have lots of joy because they are strategically partnered. Number four, get advice from wise counselors. Many of you have heard Proverbs 15, 22. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. So get advice from wise counselors. Number five, real practical stuff. Protect yourself legally. Protect yourself legally. There are tax shelters, all right, which are legal. Um, but get an LLC. It costs you less than 500 bucks. And that's called uh, LLC, Limited Liability Corporation. So when somebody pays you money, if it goes into your LLC, if anybody sues you, they only get what's in the LLC. They don't get your house. OK? Again, you can talk to someone about this. Number six, give something away this week and watch something beautiful come back to you. Regardless of where your money is, and your, give something away this week, real practically. What can you give away? It could be money. It could be some material possession. But I'm challenging you this week to give something away. All right, in the name of Jesus, give it away. And watch something beautiful come back to you because this is the rule that God's given us. You sow generously, you will reap generously. So test God in this, and he says you can actually test me in this. Number seven, aggressively pay off and avoid unnecessary debts. Aggressively pay off and avoid unnecessary debts. Number eight, ask God for wisdom in financial trials. If you're going through a financial trial right now, ask God for wisdom. He'll give you the wisdom for it. And we need God's wisdom so we don't keep making mistake after mistake and putting bad money uh, after bad money or good money after bad money, okay? Number nine, get your last will and testament settled or a trust. A last will and testament settled or a trust. Now, we use McCollum and Associates, uh, the McCollum firm. We used them for years. One of my folk that I advertise on my show, he's also a partner in our church. You want a last will testament, you want a trust, call him. You can go to the McCollumfirm.com. Now, this is important because you never know when you're going to go, right? And you don't want the state to just take your stuff. And guess what? They will. And so put it in a trust or put it in a last will and testament so you have that settled. I know but nobody likes to talk about, talk about death and all that, you know, but you take away the sting that death leaves when there's not debt after your death. Because if you do die and you have all this stuff left, guess who gets all that? All your people got to figure it out. At least I know when my mom dies, everything's taken care of. She's been talking about dying for 25 years. She <laughs> ain't gone yet, mom, I love you. But reality is, 87 years old, and mom since her 50s have told us, listen, this is my plot. It's right next to your father's, OK? It's all paid for. This is the, <laughs> this is the dress I want to wear. Maybe that's where I get it from. I told Amber, put me in my white suit. I don't care. I want them to be at the funeral, OK? And I want you all to go eat potato salad and fried chicken after it's all done. I don't care. I don't want it to be all sad. I mean, I want you to cry for a minute and make me feel good, even though I'm not there. But then after that, like, just go ahead and have a party. I don't even care. But I want to look good. She's like, I want to be cremated. I said, look, you keep acting up. I'm not going to cremate you. <laughs> you know, and, and she said, you keep acting up, I'm, I'm going to cremate you. So, you know, you got to have your own uh, family conversations about this. But death is not something necessarily that anybody likes talking about. All right. Um, here's another one. I think this is number 10. Yeah, it is. Get financial mentoring. Get financial mentoring. Find someone who you can go to to talk to you about this. And you can do it at Bridgeway, too. I mean, Betty Shepard and, and Greg and other folk who are part of our ministry can really help you deal with this. They have a uh, financial boot camp. They have mentoring. So go to our website and check out how you can do this, OK? Bridgeway.cc slash ministry slash support. Don't leave your kids with your debts. And instead, leave them with your blessings. Listen, I know I gave you a lot today, but I'm excited about it because if you actually get this right, your whole uh, family will be blessed and your children's children's children will be blessed. How cool would it be if you didn't have a mortgage? How cool would it be if you didn't have any debts? How cool would it be that you would be the lender and not the borrower? How cool would it be if you could treat for lunch? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are our master, and we decide to worship you as your slaves, your doulos, your servants. May we master money so it never masters us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.
Thank you, Dr. Anderson, for wisdom from the scriptures on mastering your money. Do you know the master? The master invites you to be a child of his. And if you'd like to learn more about knowing the master, or perhaps this week you've transitioned from unbelief to belief, we would encourage you to text FILLME, that's F-I-L-L-M-E, to 97000. We'd love to engage with you in a conversation about how you can know the master. We encourage you and invite you to further engage at Bridgeway Community Church. Please go to bridgeway.cc forward slash events to learn about all that's going on at Bridgeway and how you can be involved. One special upcoming opportunity is to be baptized as a believer. We will be doing that on June 13th right here at our Owings Mills campus. It's that time in the service where we have an opportunity to worship the Lord in giving. You can go to bridgeway.cc forward slash give or text to give for an opportunity to give. If you are our guest today, perhaps you're new to Bridgeway and you found us, we welcome you in Jesus' name. And we want you to know that this opportunity for giving is largely for those who call Bridgeway home. If you'd like to give, we promise that we would steward those resources to God's glory and the expanse of his kingdom. But we didn't get you uh, engaged in service today to make you feel obligated to give. Let's pray for the offering. Our Father, we thank you that you are a generous God. And you invite us as children to be imitators of God. And as we seek to be generous and master the money that you've entrusted to us, we ask that you would use these gifts and bless the giver to bring glory to yourself and expand your kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Whatever platform you're watching us on, whether it's Facebook or YouTube, we would invite you to subscribe and to like so that you'll hear about our upcoming services. And we look forward to seeing you on next Sunday. God bless you.